If I one fine day discover that I had been lied to all the years of my life and my mother and my father were being lied to, if I discovered that in fact, though I was bred and brought and sold like a mule, that I never really was a mule, if I discover that I never really was happy picking all that cotton and digging all those mines to make other people rich, and if I discover that those songs the darkies sang and sang were not just the innocent expressions of a primitive people, but extremely subtle and difficult, dangerous and tragic expressions of what it felt like to be in chains. My name is Marcia X. I'm an artist who tries to do anything and everything at least once. Is not so much to make really great art as much as it is to solve a problem that I have or a multitude of problems that I have or experience. So I don't know if I'm an artist first and then the feminist second, or if I'm the feminist first and the artist second. My mother's from Puerto Rico and my biological father's from Peru. His father was from Eastern Europe and his mother is indigenous. And my mother is the perfect essence of what it means to be a Puerto Rican and her family is that perfect example of the Puerto Rican sort of racial identity in that there's the gene pool is very, very diverse. I don't really know too much about what it means to be a Peruvian, but I have a very good understanding of what it means to be a Puerto Rican. So that's what I identify with. That's what I cling to. That's what's shaped me and, and everything about me. The art community that we're a part of in Norwich is very small and it's really within itself, you know? So we're not only the producers, but we're also in a way sort of the, the consumers, but not really because we're too busy putting our money towards getting supplies to get our own stuff. So I've graduated now and I just wanted to see what was out here. I'm drawn to what London could offer and I don't know London. So I'd like to learn about it. Painting extremely abstract stuff where there's just colors and paints and texture and just shit's just sort of splatted on there together. Of course, with some technique, I don't just, I try not to throw it around too much, but at the end of the day, they all have to do with being away from what feels most like home. Even though if you're a part of the diaspora, you're not necessarily from the place that your people originate from. So there's this really strange disconnect. And so I try to work through all of that in the paintings that have to do with Puerto Rico. And so I use colors that are really reflective of the homes of my family. My aunt's house, my uncle's houses, the really beautiful lush greens oranges from the flowers, etc. Pinks, really beautiful electric blues from the tiles in Old San Juan. I just try to take all those colors and paint not just something that's aesthetically beautiful, that can also reflect anxiety, detachment, yearning, strains of color, making sure that the colors don't necessarily mix, which sort of has a conversation with works that I have done on race, or the racial identity of Puerto Ricans. The one drop paintings that are square canvases with a flat color, and then there's three drops of color. And when you tip the painting, as I'm making them, I tip to paint the canvas so that the paint creates this sort of drop. And they don't drop in the same way, and it, they all look very, very different. You know, they're sort of mimicking blood slides but instead I'm using the colors of Puerto Rico. And it's not just about Puerto Rico, it's about the United States, about how the government has historically and in a contemporary sense put in place this legal and social practice of identifying oneself racially and ethnically. So a lot of Latinos, a lot of Dominicans, a lot of Cubans, a lot of Puerto Ricans like myself sort of don't know if we're black, some think that they white, some just don't know. The consensus for a long time didn't allow 
for one, especially as a Latino, to be able to readily identify themselves. A cultural identity that is technically a false consciousness that's been imposed on people. I mean, we're othered before we even sort of have a language to describe ourselves or understand ourselves. We're already othered. I made this. This is when I decided Paul Mooney said this thing for a Dave Chappelle episode that doesn't really get much more accurate than that. This is Audre Lorde. <sighs> some problems we share as women, some we do not. You, white women, fear your children will grow up to join the patriarchy and testify against you. We fear our children will be dragged from a car and shot down in the street and you will turn your backs on the reasons they are dying. My work, it starts from the self. It starts from my own personal experiences. What I remember, what I go through now, what I see, what I feel. But at the same time, it's, you know, these things that, that also inform not just myself, but my practice. It's just a part of the, the American experience, really is having to see this and deal with this, not just from afar, but it's a part of our history. It's, it's woven into our consciousness. If it's not one thing, it's the other. I think a part of our problem in assessing racism, which is what we're talking about, is racism, is that it's so normalized in our language and visual culture um, and how we say even the most simplest things, you know. <sighs> my glasses broke, so I need to put wires together to fix my glasses. Oh, it looks pretty ghetto. <laughs> where, I mean, where does that come from? Why do we use that? Well, we associate ghetto with blackness and so much of our language, especially in America and here as well, is rooted in anti-blackness, and we just don't even realize it. That's, that's at times difficult to come to terms with, or to even realize that what we're saying is so normalized, we don't understand the destruction of our own actions. And even as a woman of color, I've had to consistently remind myself that some of the things I have done were anti-black, and I just didn't realize it, you know, just sort of going with the flow, especially especially living in the South. You just go with the flow and you don't even realize that you're, you hate yourself until it's too late. And then what? Then you have to unlearn all of it. We're having a conversation about the N word and who's allowed to use it in what context. It's strange because there's enough conversations going around about the N word but not enough at the same time. Man, I don't want to sound like Oprah and be like, oh, hip hop totally ruined, you know, the N word or whatever. But I think hip hop has had a huge part in letting that language run amok, you know? Cause I lived in the suburbs. And so, you know, I see like these white kids in the burbs that have like never been to the inner city or really hung out with black people using it because Tupac says it. Well, I could give a fuck if Tupac says it. Eminem doesn't say it. Right? Um, mm. It's like Quentin Tarantino always is using that word, right? And he's always got, he's always got somebody in one of his films using it, or he's using it like he did in Pulp Fiction. And it's, the thing is, it's like when Sam, Sam Jackson says it, you know, it's like, okay, Sam Jackson's saying it. But as soon as it comes out of Tarantino's mouth, because of his tone, not just because of his phenotype but his tone and his accent and the way he speaks as soon as it comes out it's just it's, it's gross it's gross I mean even when someone is saying it to talk about how disgusting it is when it comes out of their mouth it's it's gross if you see a white boy with like a group of four black dudes your first thought is what did that white boy do to get like you know the approval of them four black dudes like that's a bad motherfucker right but at the same time, as soon as he starts dropping the N-word, it's like, you know, what? Well, it's an issue that's bigger than me and it's bigger than, than anybody in this room. 
I believe that people engage in just enough conversation to sort of get a whiff of what it is, but not enough. And that, that has to do with lived experience and interacting with your community. And your community isn't just the people on your block, it's everybody, right? We don't, we don't expand, we don't extend enough out to other people. The lack of education comes not only systematically, but within maybe family units as well, right? We don't, we don't teach our children why being racist is wrong. We just tell them that saying the N word is wrong, but we don't teach them why. We don't give them the tools to understand why. So education is a huge problem. And I think a lot of times black folk and other non-black people of color, I think at some point they just get tired of having to give out the same reason and explanation over and over and over again. Some, some country boy in the middle of freaking nowhere can go around saying, you know, half cast and not even realize his language what that means. He hasn't taken the time to contextualize or critically understand what those words mean. Now, he's not trying to be rude, maybe. At least, this is a real life thing. So when he was speaking to me, he was actually telling me how not racist he was, but he used the term half cast. We don't know how to understand our language. We're an integrated society, which means that people of color and specifically black folk have been integrated into a system that was not built with them in mind to be a part of. So that struggle is gonna be, I mean, I just saw a graph today where it's like, there's slavery, right? This is in the States, but either way, it still applies here. There's slavery, there's emancipation, there's Jim Crow, and then like, there's freedom. This is the tiniest section. This. Freedom is, is, a, is like, it's tiny in comparison to the history of our relationship with Europe or Europeans or Euro-Americans. So we got a long way to go. This shit's not stopping with us today. That's for damn sure. I really like Frida Kahlo. I have had a very interesting relationship with Frida Kahlo because I didn't know why I liked her. I just liked her. I think I clung to her because she was a Mexican woman who was a painter and she had a very interesting story and when they educate you about Frida Kahlo they always get on to the fact that she was always in pain and you know she didn't want to be a victim and she persevered and all that good stuff and that's that is essential to her narrative but she was very political and that came out in her work politically aware or active women even even though I may not agree with it, that's not what it's about for me and Frida. I will, I like Basquiat, but I, I don't know if I like him or if I miss him. You know, like Basquiat's kind of like that cousin from like, you know, a couple barbecues ago and now he's no longer around and you just sort of, his presence is felt, but it's, it's really, I don't know, abstract, but he seems to be resurfacing. At least his iconography is resurfacing. His importance in painting is resurfacing, but you don't get to see any of his work, do you, really? Because, you know, like Jay-Z might own it or some guy in New York has a whole bunch of them. Yeah, one that comes to mind is Jean Grey, who's a rapper from New York. I spit Krylon when I speak, I spray my name on it. I really like that. She also says another couple of things, but they might be too intense for this interview. <laughs> uh, I'm just joking. Seriously, though.
my opinion, the young generation of whites, blacks, brown, whatever else there is, you're living at a time of extremism, a time of revolution, a time when there's got to be a change. People in power have misused it, and now there has to be a change, and a better world has to be built, and the only way it's going to be built is with extreme methods. And I, for one, will join in with anyone, don't care what color you are, as long as you want to change this miserable condition that exists on this earth. Thank you.